Welcome back to Time for an Awakening. Before we get started this evening, I'm joined again by a special guest, neighborhood activist and tour guide at the African American Cultural Museum at Art Street in Philadelphia. Brother Richard White is with us on the line this evening. Brother Richard. Yes, uh, yes, Brother Elliot. How are you doing? How are you, sir? How are you this evening? Uh, good, good. Um, I'm um, um, interested to uh, exchange with um, Dr. Umar and kind of look into this whole thing about um, power politics. <laughs> Black power politics. Yeah, we, we're, in discuss, we're going to discuss it this evening with our guest, activist, doctor of clinical psychology, and nationally certified school psychologist, Dr. Umar Johnson, is with us this evening. Dr. Umar, how are you, sir? Good evening. Glad to be with you. <laughs> uh, glad to have you back. It's been a while. It's been a while, brother. Yes, sir. Glad to be back. Dr. Umar, let's... Um, we're going to get started with uh, with some things. But before we start, uh, before we talk about uh, the major topic that I want to touch on this evening, black power politics, which you'll be in uh, in discussion on the West Coast, uh, I think on the weekend, this weekend. Um, yes, I'm in Los Angeles now. Oh, tomorrow. Oh, okay. Well, listen, before we get started and talk, because that's a, that's a heavy subject. And uh, in this age of uh, beginning, the age of Donald Trump, uh, I think it's more important than it's ever been. But uh, let's talk about a few other things, because uh, one of the things that's always uh, uh, foremost in my mind is our young people and our children. And I see that you um, have started up uh, some online mental health screening classes for black children. Uh, talk about that, because, uh, you know, that's the first I'm hearing about it. I'm kind of excited. I want to hear you kind of. Uh, get into what it's all about and how young people okay. can get involved. Um, at present, I don't have an online training class for youth, but what I do have is I have a two, Tuesday morning black parent teleconference meeting every week okay. where black parents can call in when they have questions or issues concerning their children as it relates to education and mental health. And that call is every Tuesday. We've been doing it for almost four years, and it's 6 to 8 Eastern Standard Time, and parents can call 857-232-0158. Again, that's 857-232-0158, and the access code is 870-864-POUND. Again, 870-864-POUND. Now, in addition to that, I have the Unapologetically African Black College and Consciousness Tour which is a tour that we do um, every summer. Last year we did the uh, East Coast tour. So we started in New York City, and we took the young people, 11 to 17-year-olds, boys and girls. We took them to the Audubon Ballroom, which is where Brother Malcolm was murdered, the mm -hmm. of Malcolm in Betty Shabazz Center. We took them to the world-famous Apollo Theater. We had our own amateur night. Then we went up to Ferncliff Cemetery outside of Manhattan, the poor location at the Graves. Of Dr. Ben, Dr. Khaled, uh, Brother Malcolm, Mother Betty, Paul Robeson, James Baldwin, young Malcolm Shabazz, they're all buried in the same cemetery. And then we come to Lincoln and Cheney University for a tour, then we go to the Black African Holocaust Museum on Richmond Street there in Philadelphia. Okay. The only Black African Holocaust Museum that we have in the country, mind you. And then we go to um, Bowie, Cheney, excuse me, Bowie State, Morgan State, Coppin State the Great Blacks and Wax Museum, the Harriet Tubman Home up in uh, Auburn, New York, Frederick Douglass Home, the Harriet Tubman Museum. Then we come down to Maryland, the Bucktown, Harriet Tubman Hometown Tour, Bucktown, Maryland. That's where she's from. And then we do the Underground Railroad Tour in Eastern Shore, Maryland, the Benjamin Banneker House. And we end up at the Nat Turner Trail um, in Jerusalem, Virginia, where Nat Turner led the bloodiest slave revolt in American history. And so along with that, we take them to Dorney Park, Great Adventures. We do paintball in the park. It's very fun, very educating, but also very fun. And it's unique because it's one of the only college tours in the country that not only takes them to colleges, but takes them to significant landmarks uh, relative to the black experience. And so this year, we'll be going June 28th to July 12th out of Atlanta, Georgia. And we'll be doing the Dr. King Center, the National Civil Rights Museum, Morehouse, uh, Spelman, Clark, 
Tennessee State Fisk, Tuskegee, the George Washington Carver Museum, the Selma Civil Rights Institute, the Birmingham African Holocaust Museum. We'll be doing the Oyo Tunji African Village, the South Carolina Slave Trail, as well as the Charleston Civil War Trail. So it's going to be another power pack summer, but we're going to do the South this year. So hopefully I'll be ready for registration by the first day of Black History Month so parents can register their uh, boys and girls. Dr. Umar, I understand that you had to kind of shift your focus from your uh, your dream of uh, opening up St. Paul's College uh, for a boarding uh, school for our black boys. Uh, because of the length of time, I guess, raising the funds, you kind of had to put other uh, options in, in, the, uh, in the pipeline. Uh, talk about the project of the school at uh, formerly the St. Paul's uh, historic uh, HBCU. Well, we're still going forward with the SDMG. There's been no shift there. Okay. Uh, St. Paul's has been sold. It was just recently sold a couple of weeks ago. Oh, A okay. white developer bought it, and so they're going to tear half the campus down, and I think they're going to turn it into townhouses for white people or something mm. like that. It's okay. a shame because not only do these black colleges shut down, they're actually erased from existence. So 100 years from now, nobody will even know that a black college once stood there. So that's a shame because the history goes with it. But anyhow, what we're doing now is um, we're looking for a regular school building that we can afford with the $700,000 that we've raised. We're looking for a regular school building, and we're going to go ahead and operate the school as a regular day school until such time we have enough funds to transition it into a residential academy. Um, So that's what we're doing now. Africa is still an option for the school. Uh, I looked at a school in Pennsylvania that I really liked. The price was a bit more than what we can afford right now, but it would have been perfect. So I may go back to them later. And then I saw a school in Atlanta. Uh, wasn't exactly what I want, but it did have a nice price. If I have to go back, there's some schools in Baltimore I'll be looking at next week. So it's a work in progress, and um, there is no timeline. I mean, I'm not going to move until I feel comfortable with something that's worth moving on. I mean, I'm dealing with the people's money here. So I have to be very, very careful because the mistakes are not just experienced by me. They're experienced by the whole community because they're the ones who gave me this funding. But we've committed that the first day of school for the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy for Pan-African Excellence, the first day of school will be the anniversary of the Matt Turner War, August the 21st of 2018. That will be the first day of school. Dr. Johnson, it, it seems to me just on the outside looking in, that it would be relatively easy for some of our people to obtain, and especially a man of yourself that has a track record of working in the community and being a school psychologist, to obtain some of these vacant school buildings that they've been shutting down in black communities all over this nation. And Philadelphia is a prime example of schools, a litany of schools every year that's closing down in our communities, large edifices, Germantown High School, West Philly. I mean, these schools shutting down, and all they're doing is sitting there because white developers is in the pipeline to take over these schools. Well, you just hit the nail on the head. Okay. Uh, They're not shutting them down just to shut them down. They're shutting them down so they can be transitioned. Uh, They can be transitioned into other institutions that the white folks who are gentrifying our communities want to turn them into. The whole public school shutdown movement is part of a larger movement to regentrify the inner cities of America. In order to get rid of black people out of the city centers, you have to eliminate the schools that educate their children. So there is no gentrification without public school elimination. You have to get rid of the schools so that way it becomes easier to move the children as you move the parents. It's hard to get parents to just pack up and move when the child is already connected to a school. So you have to shut the school down to make it easier to get rid of the parents. If there was no major uh, national gentrification movement to to purge black people from the inner cities, all of these schools would still be open. This is part of the shutdown movement. The other reason why the public schools are being shut down is because they no longer need black people to participate in the economic reality. We, our labor is useless in America now, which is ironic because we were brought here to work 243 (laughs) years of it. But now, America doesn't need the black laborer. We we are useless 
from an economic standpoint, you know, which helps explain why you have over 2 million African Americans in this country with masters and doctorate degrees who cannot find work because we're not needed. And, and now, uh, and, and Obama didn't do this on his own. It started before Obama, but he really intensified it. The, multi, the multiculturalization of American politics has brought with it some very disastrous circumstances and consequences for black America. And, and at the top of that list is the fact that we are no longer the priority minority. And, you know, that's one thing that is quite unique. Going into the Donald Trump administration, this will be the first presidential administration in American history. This will be the first one, 45th president in, and this will be the first one where we are no longer the priority minority. When people think about civil rights in America, they do not think of black people anymore. They will think of homosexuals, and they will think of immigrants, and they will think of white women. And we can blame ourselves partly for that because we allowed Barack Obama to take the black agenda off the table for eight years with our support. And it has to be said, we supported that. We had no problem being ignored by the executive branch of the United States government for eight years while he went out of his way to cater to all of the minority groups. And now our children are going to suffer for it. So we're walking into a, 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 an era, an epic, an epical era in American history where black folks will no longer be the priority minority. So now you have to fight. You have to fight against the Arabs, the Asians, the Latinos, the Mexicans, the homosexuals, the white women. You're just one amongst many, whereas prior to this period of time, we were always the priority minority, and now we no longer are. Dr. Umar, you, you talked um, a few minutes ago when you talked about the schools and the uh, the gentrification kind of and, and school shuts down or school transition, so to speak, come hand in hand. A number of years ago, uh, when charter schools kind of start hitting the uh, the the ears of of black politicians and black people in general, it was an idea. And, and uh, one of the co-hosts that we had in the past with the program, we used to talk about this a lot. And, and uh, brother Richard was on the board of a Afrocentric charter school. It was an idea that our people could use these schools to teach our children, to give them a cultural base, to, to establish rites of passage in these schools for our youth. But the idea of the Afrocentric charter school, I think has been disrupted because you see more and more of these Afrocentric charter schools, the rug being pulled out from under with all types of shenanigans with money, uh, low scores, all types of excuses, but you see more and more of these white charters coming in with white teachers from Teach for America teaching our children. Uh, am I wrong to say that it was some type of uh, fix in the making in reference to this charter school phenomenon, or, or set me straight if I'm wrong? Uh, you're correct. First of all, the listening audience needs to understand the birth of the charter school movement was a white movement. It was founded by white people Go ahead. to use public money to privately educate white children. However, you cannot use public money for private issues. So the charter school was a compromise. It was a way in which you could still use the public dollar and operate a school that to some extent is managed by private citizens but legally is still a public school. A charter school is an alternative public school. It is not independent. That's why they have special ed. That's why they take the state assessments. They are public schools, but they are alternative public schools. So basically it was a little trick that was put in place to allow white folks to defund black public schools and make sure their kids were separated separately from ours. That's what it was. It was another uh, separate but equal type of a movement. That's what it was. But with Philadelphia, it's unique because Philadelphia has more charters than any other city in America, and Philadelphia has the most black-operated charter schools. But also what okay. we found was in that. 2015, we saw more black charter schools across the country be shut down. You know, there has been a war against black charter schools because it was never supposed to be about our kids in the first place. It was about white kids. That's number one. And number two, on top of that, 
remember now, they're shutting down the public schools to get rid of black people. If you got black people coming in, opening up charter schools, you know, occupying property, prime real estate, you know, in areas that have been marked for gentrification, you are in the way. So let us be very clear that a lot of these black charter schools that are being shut down were not guilty of mismanaging money, were not guilty of low test scores, were not guilty of not having enough teachers certified, which are the claims made against them. They were purely guilty of being in the way of the purging of the black community. And when you look at the schools that are shut down, you can clearly see that they were in neighborhoods that were clearly marked for Negro removal, period. Now, let me say this. We made a mistake as a community because we should have never abandoned our community control of the public schools movement. We should have never gave that up. We gave that up. That was the push in the 60s. That was the push in the 70s. And that was the push in the 80s. But when the charter school movement was birthed in 1990, a lot of us thirsty for money. We abandoned the principle of community control of public schools for the, for the, for the financial opportunity that the charter school provided. So, for example, if I'm fighting for community control of the public schools, I'm not necessarily getting any money going into my pocket. I'm simply wanting control in decision-making power over who teaches our kids how the schools are run. That was the community control movement. It didn't put money in your hands. It put power in your hands. Charter school, opposite. With the charter school movement, it doesn't put any power in your hands, but it does put the money. So when children come into a charter school, the money comes with them. So if there's a $7,000 per year pupil expenditure in your school district, well, when that child comes over to your charter school, most of that $7,000 will come with them. So a lot of people who were into the community control movement, okay, they got distracted by the money because they said, well, if we go this charter school route, you know, I can name myself the CEO, pay myself $100,000 a year, even though I'm never even in the school, hire me another principal to run the school. So we got distracted by the charter school movement. We should have never given up community control because the charter school is not community control. It is state control, and they are locally supervised by the public school district in whose geographic territory they exist. We should have never given that up. <laughs> Brother Richard, weigh in on that because you were <laughs> – go ahead. Uh, it's, it's nice, it's nice um, being able to speak with you, uh, Dr. Mark. Uh, you know, and can I can I um, uh, respectfully differ as far as um, a, a, in the context of giving up? Because, um, well, let me do it this way. Let me ask you, have we actually, because it seems what you described, we did that in relationship to the political power um, when we were supposedly moving towards organizing around electoral, not even electoral, but political power. Uh, and we went into the electoral process, certain individuals went in there and what I call now became um, political entrepreneurs. And as you say, um, it seems that the same trend occurred um, with when the charter school movement, the, the parents made a political move unorganized. That raises another question. But the point of, as you described, individuals who took on leadership in most cases, and they had to be of a certain criteria, um, took on leadership in relationship to possibly to the dollar compared to trying to create um, actual effective educational institutions for the students that um, we were um, in charge of. Uh, would you, how, how do you sway that, or do you see that trend occur, had occurred? as far as moving um, from politics to moving to the charter, and and still the same individuals, those who had skills, those who were at a certain um, strata, was the ones that became the ones who really economically benefited. Here's the thing with the charter school movement, and, you know, I support black charter schools. I mean, I work for black charter schools, so, and I've been a principal at black charter schools. But the thing is, are we looking for the greater good for all children, or are we just looking for an alternative for some? That's ultimately the question, because if you, if you want a, a better quality of education for all children, then the charter school movement doesn't give you that because all of our kids will never be accepted into charter schools, you see. so And then on top of that, charter schools, although 
legally they're not supposed to. They all do it. The black ones, the white ones, the Hispanic ones, they all do it. And that is they cherry pick the talent. They all do it. Um, although there's a lottery system in place, we know there's ways around that to make sure that you get some of the cream of the crop that's on your waiting list. So for kids who are struggling, the so-called, you know, special ed kids, the so-called, you know, ADHD, the juvenile delinquent, charter schools are not an answer for them because either they will never be accepted or once they do get there, they'll be rejected and kicked back to the local school. So for me, I'm looking for systemic change. I'm looking for systemic change. And one of the things that black America often falls for is we fall for this uh, – this remedy that only benefits some of us. And so for me, I'm looking for solutions that could benefit all of us. But let me also say this. Neither the charter school nor community control of the public school is ultimately the destiny of black America. The ultimate academic destiny for black America is for us to build our own independent schools. And and, 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 and the biggest hypocrisy of black power, the biggest contradiction collectively speaking, of us claiming to love our children is the fact that we can spend $600 million on McDonald's this past year. We spent $2 billion on Air Jordans this past year, $4 billion on liquor and beer, $9 billion on perm and weed, Philadelphia, $3 billion on Christmas. This is what we spend for one day. And we cannot buy these abandoned schools and transform them into the type of learning centers our children need to have. So I think the black community got to look at itself. Why are we settling for charter when we got the money to do so much more? Why do we even have to settle for community control when we have the ability to do so much more? It's one thing to discuss the racism in the school system, but it's something else to discuss the neglect that we as a people have for the best interests of our children. And, and that's and that's um, if, if you don't mind me, Elliot. But that's the um, challenge that I, I'm I'm trying for us to you know un- unpack right now because we have to understand what it is. And that's why on one um, point I would like us to let's start with really the definition of power, because I think in both cases, as you're alluding to, when we're talking about state sponsor, and and and, and I do say the um, political machinery is still state-sponsored, right? You're still trying to get state resources. um, And then on the educational front, the system, you're dealing with the education, which is state-controlled. But when we look at our historical long view, we had done those things. I mean, at the turn of the century after the Civil War, we did sponsor development, educational, and um, other academic institutions that you described in your tour, um, these historically black colleges, black people did that, and they did that with less resources than we do now. So it's something else that's going on. And is it? And, and what I'm asking you, maybe you know, in short, is is that in our redefinition in this generation or two of what power is? Here's the thing, and I agree with you there. Now, we have more capital now. We have more education now. But what our ancestors had 50 to 100 years ago was they had the psychological resources. We lack the psychological. We have all the material resources. We got the degrees. We got the money. But we lack the psychological resources. And by psychological resources, I'm talking about the commitment. I'm talking about the courage. I'm talking about the consistency. I'm talking about the sacrificial spirit. We don't have that. In the post-Dr. King assassination era, and of course next year will be 50 years since Dr. King's assassination, and in those 50 years, we haven't had a single, not one, protracted, comprehensive movement to change any aspect of black reality in a systematic way. Not one. When you look at every movement we've had since, since the Civil Rights Movement, they have all been very short-sighted, and most of them have lasted for only a day. You look at the Million Man March. It was beautiful, but it was one day. You look at the Al Sharpton March. He got it coming up um, January 14th to D.C. One day. The Occupy movements, one day. Even the rebellions, one day. It's like we've grown lazy. When you look at a civil, you look at the Montgomery bus boycott, that was 391 days, 371 days. That's almost a complete year. 
Okay, we don't have that no more. And a part of it comes from the fact that black America, we have not indoctrinated our children with that same type of race pride, community respect, and cultural loyalty that our ancestors had. You know, our children are less interested in black power politics than probably any generation of black folk we've ever birthed. And the danger is that the current generation of black children, they did not experience at all any of the struggles that we had to go through in order for them to be for them to be in a position that they are in now. They are the most integrated consciously. They are the most multicultural. They are definitely the most anti African. But we've created this monster. We've created it. And it's a shame because if we don't do something about it soon, I'm not too sure there will be black people in the twenty second century. I don't think we will survive the twenty first century if we don't reor- reorient and reorganize ourselves in a significant way because we're losing, we're losing bad, we're losing big. And ironically, as bad as we're doing, you have black people talking about it's never been better. We're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation, and we're going to break into the topic of black power politics. There's a few other topics I want to hit before we get to the black power politics, but you can join the conversation, too, at 215 215- Four nine zero nine eight three two. That's two one five four nine zero nine eight three two. We're in conversation with activist and doctor of clinical psychology and certified school psychologist, Dr. Umar Johnson. History is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go, what they still must be. The relationship of history to the people is the same as the relationship of a mother to her child. Welcome back the time for an awakening we're joined in conversation this evening with doctor of clinical psychology activist and certified school psychologist dr umar johnson is, has joined us this evening in conversation black power politics is one of the topics we're talking about and we're going to be talking about that soon i want to touch on a few other things dr umar to get your opinion on them uh you talked about our children that we fail to indoctrinate our children with race pride, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. But before I venture down that path of what you just stated, let me say this for my hopes and aspirations moving forward into this new calendar year, that our people uh, come up with solutions. I'm involved in organizations. Brother Richard is involved in organizations. Dr. Umar, your work nationally speaks for itself. I hope that we come up with solutions to stop these people from brutalizing black children, black men, and especially these young black girls. Uh, Going out of this year and coming into this new calendar year, you had three assaults that had been plastered all over, and it might not have been on national news, but uh, it's important for us to know it. The, The young mother and her daughters that got brutalized by a cop down in the outside of Atlanta when they called the police about a white neighbor that had put their, put his hands on her son. She did uh, sp- supposedly the right thing by calling the police. And the next thing you know, she slammed to the ground along with her daughters and thrown in the back of a wagon. A uh, young lady uh, in school, I don't know whether it was school police or a regular cop, that the body slammed this young lady down there in North Carolina. And then in Philadelphia, right in our own backyard, a uh, cop, pummeled at a girl in southwest Philadelphia on the ground uh, with both hands just pummeling her in her face. These type of things have to stop. And if we don't stop it or come up with ways where we can stop it, it's not going to stop. And especially with this new administration coming in, speak to that issue before I uh, touch on what you just talked about, Dr. Omar. Well, my ancestor Frederick Douglass said, power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. 
I believe that we, as black people, have created the type of white people that we have in America today. We're responsible for their arrogance. We're responsible for their aggression. We are as responsible for what the police do to black people as is the government. When we look at these past eight years with the murder of Trayvon and going on to Michael Brown and Walter Scott and everyone else, Freddie Gray, the black community really didn't do anything systematic against those excesses by the police. Our children took to the streets. It was our children who rioted, but most of the adults turned a blind eye to it. Most of the adults did absolutely nothing. And when it came to holding Barack Obama accountable, he was totally, totally allowed to get away with doing nothing about police extermination. Absolutely nothing. Had Obama been white, black folks would have marched all over the White House. But because he was black, we cared more about him than we cared about our own children. And we defended Obama while we castigated everybody else, failing to recognize that that was the most hypocritical thing we could have done because the president of the United States is the top law enforcement officer in the country. He is the top cop. And to not hold him accountable, to not at least force him to order a United States Department of Justice investigation into the systematic killings of unarmed defenseless blacks by police, that speaks to our cowardice. That speaks to our weakness. And that speaks to our uh, political um, ineffectiveness. Now, going forward, I'm going to say this. And I'm very careful with my words, especially when it comes to topics of violence. But I believe that black America has let white folks go so far. I think we've let them do too much that I don't see, there, there will be no political, I don't see a political or peaceful reconciliation to the police extermination crisis. <laughs> I believe that we're going to have to do what we've had to do in the 20s, what we had to do in the 40s we had to do in the 60s. I don't think this is going to stop without a catastrophe of epic proportions. And what I mean by that is I think a time is going to come where black, the black community is going to go to war with the police. And we cannot beat the police. We're not even going to war to win it because you can't. But you're going to war to get your respect back and to force them to change the way they do business. America is not going to do nothing about the murders of black folks by police until something starts happening to the police. That is a fact. You can take that to the book. They will continue to kill us like they're doing until something is done by us that supersedes politics because we've let it go too far. Have we stepped in sooner? Possibly. But this has been going on since Rodney King and even before so. And the only way it was chilled out before was because we went – I mean, you look at – the Negroes with Guns movement. You look at the Deacons for Defense. You look at the Black Panther movement. You look at the Garvey movement. The only time police retreated temporarily, albeit temporarily, was when we stood toe-to-toe with them. And I really think it's worse now than it was then. So I think that's what it's going to take. There's going to need to be deaths on both sides in order for this thing to cease. But isn't all those examples you gave is when um, we as as black people um, and those different generations uh, those men and women actually started organizing um, or at least had what they called a cadre of organizers within the community that was prepared to do certain acts in an organized fashion. And what I'm saying is, isn't it that the president has to be the self-organizing in the community by individual leadership, and that is not what's going on now? I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you, and I would also say that there's two other pieces to this puzzle, too, gentlemen, and that is that both the black church, which has been the primary um, organizing apparatus, as well as black leadership, has both have both underwent a significant change um, in the post-Dr. King era. Uh, the church used to be the galvanizing force. The church was the vanguard for the black community. The black church was birthed in the black revolutionary tradition. And it has, and in the post Dr. King era, the black church has reinvented itself, and it has become nothing more than an organization that exploits people economically and prepares them for death. That's it. The black church does have does not have a political or economic function for Black America. It is totally impotent, impotent politically and economically. It does nothing for us. That is exceptions to that rule. But by and large, the black church has been absent on the job 
when it comes to the black struggle. And black leadership the same way. Black leadership reinvented itself from being an antagonistic engine for social change to an accommodationist engine for social change. So you look at a Dr. King, who people would say was nonviolent, but he was extremely aggressive when it came to challenging and demanding from the executive branch of the government things that black people needed. He was extremely aggressive. He was antagonistic with the system. Now, you compare that to a Jesse Jackson on Al Sharpton. They are very uh, accommodationistic. They do not make demands. They do not agitate. They simply accommodate. They have meetings. They get a couple of concessions, and life goes on. We have this new build a relationship with the oppressor politics that is absolutely killing black people. Dr. Umar, you, <clears throat> you, you, you know, you, you mentioned about uh, uh, the politicians and, uh, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about black power politics, about holding these people accountable. And, and in this age that we're moving into this so-called age of Trump, you know, more and more, I believe that any of our people, that align themselves or try to take the middle ground or straddle the fence have to be held accountable by our people. And that includes entertainers, athletes, uh, 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 politicians, the black bourgeoisie, any of them that put our people out there like cannon fodder needs to be held accountable. This recent thing that has happened at Talladega uh, College in Atlanta, uh, in, in uh, Alabama, uh, the school president uh, is sending the young people there to march in the Trump inaugural ball or parade or whatever. You know, he's not there. He won't be marching. But to send our children out there like cannon fodder in front of all these white bigots that's going to be out there, who knows what could happen. They might throw something. Children might get injured. Anything could happen. This guy for some 40 shekels or 40 pieces of silver or whatever he received, He's going to send the children out there to march in some Trump inauguration parade. G- give me your opinion before I, I mention a couple other topics. Well, that is cowardice. You know, that that that, 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 that is cowardice. Um, and don't get me wrong. Children do have a place in the struggle. Dr. King had children march. Children marched in a lot of our movements, but they, they marched with the adults. And I'm not familiar with that particular situation going on there. Okay. But I do have to say this, though. You know, a lot of black people are up in arms about the Trump situation, and they want to march on Trump, and Al Sharpton is about to march on Trump, but where was you, Reverend Al, in the past eight years? You never marched on Obama. Obama didn't do one thing for black folks, and you didn't march on him. So Trump is And no wasn't critical of him Obama. either. <laughs> exactly. Trump, was, is no Obama. Trump is no worse than an Obama. No worse than an Obama. If, if, if you look at what happened under Obama's administration, if the president would have been white, black folks would have lost their mind. If a white president tried to homosexualize the black community the way Obama did, we would have went crazy. If a white president let all those black boys be murdered like that from the Tamir Rice's on down, I mean, he was looking at basically a murder a month, okay, on tape. If a, if a white president would have turned the blind out of that, black folks would have went off. But because he was black, white folks knew what they was doing. That was all part of the strategy. Put a black face in that they find attractive, okay? Because if he would have been a blue, black, purple, black man, black folks probably would have, would, have, would, have, would have held him accountable. But because he was not, they did not hold him accountable. And white people knew we would be able to do anything we want behind a black face. And that's exactly what they did. They didn't roll back the Civil Rights Act. Half of that had been chewed away. They didn't roll back the Voting Rights Act. Half of that had been chewed away. I mean, when you look at the losses that black people suffered under Obamaism, it is amazing that you still have so many black people who are in defense of his administration as if it was some type of a blessing when no measurable progress came out of it. Dr. Umar, you mentioned about uh, early in the conversation with Richard about we failed as adults to indoctrinate our children with race pride. Yes. And that, now we see uh, an all-out blitz to indoctrinate our children with homosexuality now yes. you know it's coming from the other side because it's always been part of europeans culture now that's not a racist statement that's a fact homosexuality has always been an accepted part of european culture going back to europe it's never been an accepted part 
of any African-based cultures. But we see that it's on all our blitz to indoctrinate our children to accept and be part of homosexuality. Uh, I'm glad I have you on the program as a clinical psychologist to give me some insight on the difference between the femininity or effeminate and homosexuality. The reason I'm asking this is this. Even when I was in school, you had some guys that would run around and, oh, don't do this. And I, you know, they, they had a little the feminine about them. Uh, and, you know, you guys called them whatever. they call, You know, boys and young people will be boys, young people. They call them names or whatever. But is there a difference between a child that's a feminine and homosexuality? That, there's got to be. But you, you, you're the doctor of psychology. You, uh, throw some light on this for me. Well, effeminate behavior is behavior that is stereotypically um, associated with a particular gender. Okay. So if a boy has a light voice, if he walks a certain way, you know, if he has, you know, fatty hips or breasts, you know, that's effeminate. Effeminate, effeminate, effeminization speaks to the behavior. It speaks to the presentation. He is effeminate in his ways. It does not speak to sexual attraction to the opposite sex. Excuse me, sexual attraction to the same sex. When you talk about sexual attraction for someone of the same gender, that's homosexuality. So you can be homosexual and very masculine. You go into prisons. There's a lot of homosexuals who are very masculine. You would never want to even think that they had sex with men or were sexually attracted to men. They were masculine homosexuals. Just like you can have effeminate heterosexuals. Okay, I know brothers who are not gay, okay, or at least I don't think they are, but are very effeminate in their demeanor. That's just who they are for whatever reason. So the two are separate. They can be related, you know, because most gay men are effeminate. They do have a female presentation about them. Uh, but you can be effeminate and be heterosexual. You can be masculine and be homosexual. So one speaks to the behavior. The other speaks to the actual psychological attraction to someone of the same gender. Now, that that, now that, that, that would boil down into a choice. If it's a behavior, just say, for example, if a, if a young boy had a mother with no dad around and was raised with a bunch of sisters, he would pick up certain things. Is that what you're saying? I think I think that may predispose them to being effeminate. Okay. But I don't think being raised by a woman with nothing but girls around will engender in you an attraction for someone of the same gender. I don't see that. In my work with boys, what I found amongst the homosexual black boys, like 99% of them were all sexually abused by men in okay. their family, like nearly every single one, which is interesting because when you hear about the gay rhetoric, you always hear one narrative. It's always the same narrative. And that narrative is that, you know, they're born gay. Well, I've been doing this work for almost 20 years, and that is not what I'm finding. I haven't found a single black male yet who did not present with evidence that clearly indicated to me that this was about nurture, not nature. And again, as I said, most of them were sexually abused as boys, okay? And they've confessed it, you know, and for many of them, the, the molestation was the first sexual act that they encountered. The molestation was the first sexual act. So it wasn't like they had lost their virginity with a woman and now they were abused. No, their introduction to sex was with a male. And the irony in that is I do not like it, but it's the only thing I'm familiar with. And I think that's why a lot of gay black men, gay men, period, but especially for black males, it, it creates that internal struggle because it's like, I do not like this, but on the other hand, this is what I've been exposed to. I'm most comfortable with it. To make a long story short, black parents in the larger black community have a lot to do with the prevalence of homosexuality because of who we leave our children with. I mean, bottom line, if, if, if it's being triggered by molestation in so many cases, and that's not the only route. It's the primary route, but it's not the only route. Um, I've also seen homosexuality triggered by psychological castration. And what I mean by psychological castration, I'm speaking of psychological abuse. When boys are psychologically abused by their mother or father, which is to say that they're constantly told that they are inept as a male, 
that they are inadequate as a man, those messages can begin to condition the unconscious in such a way that the boy doesn't feel that he can ever be a man. And so as such, he starts developing attraction for another man. He starts looking for the protection from a man that he himself has been made to feel he can never provide to a woman. So I've seen that route as well. But the largest route for black males, without question, is the molestation. And it doesn't get talked about enough because, number one, uh, the LBGT community don't want to deal with that part of it. They don't want to deal with it. And then also, it's not comfortable for men, gay or straight, to admit that they were sodomized. I mean, that's not something that you really want to talk about. Even when we go back to slavery, you can hardly find any slave uh, narratives where homosexuality was mentioned. But we know... Yeah, you know it went on. Black male slaves, yes, we know it went on because it's not comfortable for men to talk about being raped by other men. So that's something that always stays out of the public conversation when it relates to homosexuality. But the whole point, it's about population control. And this is something that the LBGT community doesn't understand as it relates to my position. You know, they say, well, he hate gays. I don't hate gays. I've never, ever advocated hurt or harm for homosexuals. You know, I love all black folks gay or straight, but I don't agree with that lifestyle because as a nationalist, I got to be concerned about the best interests of my nation. And in a situation where the black family is already an endangered species, why would you add something like this? Why would we add this piece of confusion to an already overwhelming issue? We already have dismally low rates of um, dual parented households. We already have dismally low rates of black women being married. We already have dismally high rates of, of black divorce. So why would you add homosexuality into a black family dynamic that is already at risk of being destroyed and eliminated? So if you love the black family, and if you appreciate the black family, and if you know that we need the black family in order to build strong black communities, there's absolutely no way you can be a supporter of the LBGT lifestyle. It doesn't mean you have anything against the individuals who practice, but there's no way you can support and condone that when you see how it is eating away at the fabric of what a black community is supposed to be about. And, and if, I, if I may add what the concern I have with this um, as a political, social um, perspective is the point that now what is considered the LBG community politically is enforcing its political will yes. in, in relationship to the black yes. community. And yes. that's, that's the challenge that I'm, I'm having from the perspective of, if, I mean, and they have that right. And as you said earlier about when you were talking about ethnic groups in relationship to the, to the black community um, and legitimately pushing their interests within the social political um, arena, you know, we, it still gets back to, well, how did we define power? so that we can continue to define pa what a family is and being able, because I think this here question about that defining power goes through all the threat, even up to mental health, because what I hear now, one, is the notion that our community is in trauma, you know, from children to adults, mm -hmm. and trauma like they just came out of war. So they're dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome, and the medical community is getting ready to classify the whole community as a health problem, a public health problem. Well, here's the thing. Under white supremacist doctrine and system mythology, nothing that benefits white folks will ever be maligned by white folks. So self-hatred, post-traumatic slavery disease, homosexual, anything that we do, that is dysfunctional as a people, if it benefits the power structure, it will never be attacked as an issue, never. You know, so we'll never see this LBGT thing dealt with the way it should be dealt with because it benefits the power structure. And the whole purpose of it is population control. The whole purpose of it is population control. Two men cannot reproduce, two women cannot pre reproduce. And if you target the children, see, our children, and I have two daughters, our children, my children, are the first generation of black babies who have to contend with homosexual rhetoric. I didn't have to deal with that growing up. 
I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be in fourth and fifth grade and I'm being told about this way of life. I never even knew what homosexuality was when I was in fourth and fifth grade. I don't even think I learned about that as a way of life until high school. But our kids in the second and third grade are being introduced to this on purpose because that's how you socialize the children to accept it. Mm-hmm. And children are curious by nature. Children are curious by nature. So if you introduce something into their life and you promote it and propagate it as something being great, most of them will not be able to resist the urge to experiment with it. A lot of our children today are experimenting with the homosexual lifestyle simply because they've been made aware of it. It has invaded the school system now. And that's another reason why public and charter school is not going to be no solution for black folks, because as long as you're under that public dollar, you're going to have to push the public doctrine. And the rule is clear. They want that stuff taught in the schools, and they want it taught early. Yes. This is, a, this is social engineering. This is social engineering at its finest. Yeah, we're going in the second hour, which uh, is coming up now. We're going to break off into the subject of black power politics. Before we do that, let's let's grab a couple of these callers here. Let's go to two six seven area code. What's your name? Where you calling from? Can you hear me, Bill Elliott? Yes. Yes. Good guess you have, but Umar and uh, Brother Richard. Um, I like to touch on the subject of this Calabria College uh, marching band. And I, myself, am a product of HBCU. And if I had my choice before I leave this planet, I visit many, but I haven't visited them all in the United States of America. And I say that to say because from these HBCUs, we've had all kinds of people that are African-American graduate from these places. And if it was not for these people graduating from these HBCUs, America would not be where they're at today. Some of these HBCUs have been underground railroads, they've been used as laboratories, they've, they've participated in sending our people off on all levels of society to work in all forms independently or for other corporations or building their own corporation and things of that nature. My thing is, is that when I see a school like Tal- Talladega, who a little bit after the Civil War was built on the backs of slaves, Right after the Civil War, to have a place of education for our, for our people to go yesterday, today, and in the future. And these children, I should say young adults, not even children, these young adults, are participating in a inauguration with Trump, who gives us the rhetoric of where he's coming from when it comes to his racial ideology with his racist cabinet and his racist theology of putting and turning this country upside down, where the racism is already here, he highlights it. These children are being put under the gun to march in his band, his inauguration. Not all in their thought. I heard a program today on a radio station, on that program, and alumni called up and said she's very dissatisfied. A lot of alumni are of these, you talked about mentoring young people to go out here in society to deal us as African men and women, and we have to be under the gun of participating in something that has nothing to do with us when it comes to our politics. Now, I look at the administration for coaching these things, but like Elliot's saying, a lot of people went to 12 pieces of silver at the detriment of ruining the psychology of our youth. And if you look at the televisions in Alabama, we look at some of the blacks that came out of Alabama. I had an aunt that came out of Mobile, Alabama. And the thirty, she came up here with the rest of my family in the South. Most of my people are from, the, are from Georgia and from also from Jacksonville, Florida. But I had an aunt from there. And those folks during that time period, man, went through a lot of stuff. Uh, for instance, a friend of mine, uh, Professor Singley, Temple University, he's a Tyler, Tyler Digger graduate, undergrad. He left take a college day to come up here in the early 70s, got him in the Temple's Law School. He did Temple's Law School, went and got his LLM at Yale and came back and taught at Temple. If anybody knows Carl Sammy's battle at Temple University with racism, it's been ongoing. 
another fighter from Alabama, Sonny Sanchez, but people know it, from Alabama, Angela Davis. My point to you is that Alabama, Jacksonville, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, our people caught hell there. And this needs to come to the front, that you just don't do this. And our HBCU, which has been like an incubator for our people to make it. Now, we've seen from this Trump administration, our children can't hardly go to Penn and Temple and Millersville because of the, the, the symbol of racism swastikas. Well, bring, uh, it, bring, it, Trump disciples. bring it home for me. Is, bring it home. Is, my, right. Bring it my home for me, is, Brother Tim. Okay, hold on. My point is, sir, is that there needs to be a protest to stop these things early. This is the beginning of what Trump's normalization will do to us if we let his administration and the rest of these races swallow us up. I want to know your opinion of that. Dr. Umar? Yes, sir, I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, any comment on what the, the brother mentioned? I want to say this, and I agree with much of what he said, but I want to say this. We don't need any more protests. we got to understand something. <laughs> we are in a power relationship with white folks. Racism is a power relationship. If they can do something against you despite your will, they're enforcing power. That's domination. So we don't need to protest nothing. If, re- if racism is based on a power relationship between the races, one being able to dictate his will against the other, all we have to do is change our behavior. <laughs> you don't need to protest. Change. Behavior, white people would change theirs. All behavior is a function of the consequences. All behavior is a function of the consequences. You see, it's, it's very contradictory to say, on one hand, I want reparations, but I'm going to keep on spending $600 million at McDonald's. That's a contradiction. It's, it's, it's a contradiction to say, I'm a boycott Walmart, but I don't want to stop buying from Walmart. Okay. You need to divest totally from all these European economic engines and create your own replacements. That's what we need to be doing. We don't need another protest. We need to change our behavior. White folks will respond as you respond. So that's what we need to focus on. What we, W.E.B. Du Bois once said, he once said that if black people would take, and I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said if we would take half the energy we spend trying to change white folks towards us and use that energy to try to change ourselves towards them, we could solve half of our problems. It ain't about a protest. It's about a change in behavior. And, and, and if I may add that, that the, um, I see um, Dr. Wade Nobles and uh, Dr. Jerome Fox, I'm putting those two um, definitions of power, and that's as you, you, you kind of hear me kind of pushing us to, con- to define it, because we could, in order for the future not to be, as you say, Dr. Umar, we have to re- clearly redefine what power is and sit it in front of us. And therefore, I like to have others respond to our definition as if it was their own. But the other side, the intra-psyche, for us to accept, to be, to, to be able to accept, the, to be able to deal with the consequences in spite of whatever is dealt to us. And that's the part where we kind of shifted away that we are not willing to deal with the consequences in spite. We can define it, but you also, once you define it, there may be some pushback, and you can't just give up on what you define because you, the consequences is too tough. And that's when you do that, then you stick to that definition regardless of what the circumstances may be, and I think that's where we are. Oh, yeah, well, here's, here's another thing. You know, a lot of times we have conversations on why we haven't made more progress than we have. Why are we still stuck in the same quicksand? And it's real simple. Two pieces of that answer. One piece of that answer is black people do not want power. No, we don't. We have been raised and indoctrinated by church 
to believe that power is evil. We don't want power. <laughs> we want acceptance. Black folks mm. are in love with white people. We love white folks. We don't want no independent reality. Hell no. All I want is to finally be accepted by my slave master. We got to understand something. Our history in America is a history of exclusion. You can't go to their school. You can't live in a neighborhood. You can't shop where they shop. You can't eat where they eat. You can't marry their woman. You have been excluded and rejected and denied by white folks so long that black people have been spending the last 151 years since the 13th Amendment trying to force white people to accept them. We don't want power. We don't want power. We want to belong. We want to participate. We want participation, not power. When Chinese come to America, when Arabs come to America, East Indians come to America, they do not seek acceptance from white people. No, they don't. They seek to do what? Build up an independent political economic base that is barricaded in by their culture. Culture becomes a weapon. It is the foundation. It is the border. Okay? It is the roof. And inside of that is their political economic empowerment. Everyone does that for black folks. Everyone does that for black folks. Black folks don't want no independent communities. We had them. We gave them all. You don't want that. We want to be accepted by white folks. Why is Obama so popular amongst black folks, even though he did nothing for black people? Nothing at all. Because he was accepted by white folks. They made him their president. That's why we can't move. Black people do not want anything that excludes them from being able to love on and be around white folks. That is the goal for black America. Wow. White and then, participation. <laughs> and can I, can I add uh, a historical note to that? Um, it's a reading out of um, The Balance of Power. In, February, in October 16, 1847, delegates for the National Convention of Colored People and their friends met in Troy, New York. They resolved to push for the procurement of political rights and against any plan of emancipation involving a resort to bloodshed which may be what might have to, have to happen if you go that extra road of what it takes in order to um, deal with executing power, is which, which is what I take it that you are saying. Yes, sir. We are still stuck on integration, and the religious community has a big role to play in this because all they do is remind black people how evil power is. You know, we don't have conversations on power. We have conversations on participation. We are still stuck on integration. And the church constantly tells you what, okay, that, the, you know, the meek will inherit the earth and the poor man will go to heaven and the camel will go through the eye of a needle before a rich man enters heaven. So the, what you need to do in order to move forward, you're told it is wrong and it is sinly. It is sinly to be having conversations about amassing wealth. It is sinful to be having conversations about building political economic power. What does that have to do with God? It, 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 it is sinful to be dedicated to black pride and black power when your Lord doesn't deal in color at all. The things that we need to do, the things we need to pay attention to, and the things we need to prioritize are not valid. In fact, they are condemned by the black church. So with that said, what, and I apologize, I, I, I like to see what, how Dr. Omar responds to this. With that said, what does that say about those of us who consider ourselves Pan-Africanists? Because we're supposed to understand that understanding, and that, the, or we come out of a tradition of a history that um, recognized what that true definition of power and supposed to have been incorporating that in our behavior. But can we see any signs, uh, maybe you do, um, as you get around the country, uh, that those of us who carry this belief or ideology or so-called behavior, that we have um, amassed a certain amount of wealth, that we have educated and, and continue, as you're doing, a certain amount of students, and we have um, organized and made decisions that reflect our power, even if we're a minority of the population, the black well, population. Well, if, if I take it from dealing with the strict parameters of Pan-Africanism and just take it to the larger parameter of black consciousness, generally speaking, the black consciousness community has lost its war against the black church. And the reason it has lost its war 
against the black church is because it basically operates just like a church. And that is, it is driven by rhetoric and a lack of action. I mean, when you go to church, church is not about changing anything in the black community. Church is about listening to the message, donating some money, and preparing for life after you die. That's all church is. <laughs> black consciousness is very similar. It just works in the reverse. It's still rhetoric. It's still money. But instead of worrying about life after you die, we're worrying about life before we were born. So within the conscious community, you know, there's this emphasis on recovering your history, recovering your culture, studying the great civilizations of the past. Okay, so you're dealing with the remote past, and the church is dealing with the remote future. Nobody's dealing with the present. That's where the gap is. That's where the vacuum is. That's where the attention needs to be paid, and that's why the black consciousness movement has not worn out against the church because we do not offer a viable, practical alternative. We operate just like the church operates and have a nerve to condemn it. We're in conversation this evening with activist, a doctor of clinical psychology, and nationally certified school psychologist, Dr. Umar Johnson, is with us this evening. You can join the conversation, too, at 215-490-9832. That's 215-490-9832. Let me take a few of these callers before break. Caller, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Caller, are you there? I think you this calls in California. California, are you there? Let's let's put the caller back on hold. Let's go to this one. Caller, what's your name? Where you calling from? Caller? Let's put them back on hold. Let's take this one here. Two one five area code. What's your name? Where you calling from? Two one five area code. What's your name? Where you calling from? Let's go to this one. 757 area code. What's your name? Where you calling from? Can you hear me, caller? We're going to take a brief break. I might have to clear this board. We're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, we're going to continue the uh, discussion. Black power politics is the topic we'll be transitioning into. Give us a call at 215-490-9832. That's 215-490. 9832 joint transition into uh, the topic of conversation black power politics dr johnson you know we've had a black president now for the past eight years some of our people think he's done a great job he pushes his signature affordable care act is his signature piece of legislation uh we look affordable at affordable care act was for america <laughs> affordable care act was for black folks <laughs> I, I agree See, with you when, <laughs> i agree you, with you, you follow me in other words he, he gave homosexuals three laws, and those three laws were not for America. Those three laws were for homosexuals. He gave the white women the Equal Pay Act. That wasn't for America. That was for white women. <laughs> he gave the immigrants legislation. So you can't say that he did something for black folk by giving us the Equal Pay Act, because that wasn't for black folk. That was for America. What did he do for black folks? Because we can point to things he did just for gays, just for immigrants just for women mm -hmm. what did he do just for blacks name me one law <laughs> or one program that he did just for blacks in eight years <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with you but but then you look at a city like philadelphia that had for years a black mayor a black a district attorney a black fire commissioner police commissioner a bunch of black city councilmen a black sheriff I mean, every office seemed like in the city of Philadelphia, if you use that as a model, was black. But it didn't translate into any power. That's right. The definition that you're using, black power politics, go into that for me. What do you see in reference to what you assert when you say black power politics? Get the people to understand what you mean. Well, if you look at the example you used, Philadelphia, and you can use any city for that matter. Whenever black people ascend to political office, black people tend to descend 
politically and economically. And the reason why that is is because although there's a black face, that black face is funded and controlled by white money. Wilson Good was financed by the Democratic Party, not black folks. John Street was financed by the Democratic Party, not black folks. Barack Obama was financed by the Democratic Party, not black folks. If we want black politicians to be loyal to a black agenda, then we're going to have to finance them. That's how you keep black politicians loyal. The other thing, we have to stop letting leaders choose themselves. That's a big problem black folks got. We're the only people who do that. No other community do the leaders choose themselves. In every other community, the people decide who's going to represent us. But in the black community, because we are infected with this messianic consciousness, we believe the leader is just supposed to rise up in seas. That's not mature. That does happen sometimes, but messiahs don't come around every 10 years. So as a result of that, you have to make your leaders. Look what white folks do. They have military academies. They make their leaders. Chinese <laughs> make their leaders, and black people pray for ours. How are you going to catch up when everyone else is raising their leaders and you praying for your leaders? We have to start using our money to serve our politics. Isn't it amazing with all the problems that black people have? We do not have any lobbying groups on Capitol Hill. That's, a, that's amazing for a trillion-dollar people with so many problems that we have. We have nobody in D.C. who we finance to throw money around at the congressman to push legislation that's favorable to black folks. We don't have no lobbying groups. We don't have no political action committee dedicated exclusively to black issues. So politically, we are totally disorganized and immature. We fall in love with politicians when we should be holding them accountable. We vote for black people just because they're black. And I've said this a million times. In fact, my first law for black power politics in the 21st century, stop worrying about the color in the office and start worrying about how you will be able to control them when they get into office. In other words, I don't need a black president. I don't need a black mayor. I don't need a black governor. I do not need a black elected official. I'm not against it. If the city is predominantly black, the mayor should look like the people. I'm not against it. But it's not a it's not a requirement for me. Negroes got this thing where we need a black person in there. You always hear black people say this. We need a black person. I don't need a black person in there. Because I know that even if they're black, if they were financed by white folks, they're going to carry out a white agenda regardless. What I need to be able to do is to use my money and political influence to control the elected official who is in office. You don't see Chinese running for president. You don't see Arabs running for president. You don't see East Indians trying to be the governor of your state. They know they can't, but they use their economic muscle to control who gets in that office by how they contribute to their campaign. We have to change the narrative and the paradigm under which black America practices politics. Brother Richard, jump in. Uh, I'm, I was just, uh, you know, I, I, I'm Brother Umar, I, I agree with you, and I'm kind of also, uh, if you don't mind me adding, is that that process, as you said, as far as cultivating that, um, leaders means that you have to have organizations on the ground in the community that are looking for leaders, like people are looking for uh, scouts out here looking for um, basketball talent or football talent, <laughs> which we don't have, um, and therefore we don't have the local organizational process. Um, what, what do you what do you see as you move around in the different cities that you're in? Are we moving towards that, or is that, I mean, when I say moving towards that, you have mentioned many times about the church being that nexus at one point in time, but we know that's not their, their agenda. Is there a new formation going on, even if it's not capable at this point to exhibit itself? 
that does those things when we're talking about black power and, and power politics? I think it's coming. I think it's a process. I can see the evolution. But even for those Africans who are not addicted to integration and white acceptance and approval, I've noticed that those of us who are conscious, and even those who are not necessarily members of the conscious community, but who are progressive in their thinking to some extent, still suffer from a debilitating, paralyzing pessimism. There is a very strong cloud of paralyzing pessimism in the black community. It's like we have absolute faith that black people will fail at anything we do. I mean, I'm meeting elders, I'm meeting people my age, I'm meeting young folk, religious, non-religious, political, religious. We have absolute faith in that we will fail at anything we do. Wow. Nothing of substance can be, can be achieved when everyone is so inculcated with pessimism. I mean, you hear it all the time. That's not going to work. Black people can't work together. You know, somebody's going to steal the money. I mean, you, that's all you hear. And, and so and the you, children are being indoctrinated with this collective consciousness of learned helplessness. There's it, two things i like to uh, uh, get your reaction to on that, because um, I know around Philadelphia, the one thing that I've been saying, and you kind of alluded to it earlier in our discussion, um, I've asked, um, 150 years from now, what does black Philadelphia look like? Um, and, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to keep raising this because um, Mr. Garvey said, without no vision, the people perish, right? And what I get as a response that goes to your pessimism that you are observing is that most people say we won't be around. And how is that, how is that so? So I ask you as a, a, psych, a psychologist, as we're talking about power, what is it in the mechanism? Is that a is that also a social psychological learned behavior, or is no, that without a, question. a fear? Without question. First of all, we have three psychological hangups. We have three psychological uh, disabilities that we're going to need to overcome if we're going to move forward. Three that I have observed in my work. Number one, we depend on God more than any other group does. We give God too much of the responsibility for solving our problems. No other group relies on the most high to the extent that black people does. And it has nothing to do with our spirituality. It's because we're lazy. We don't want to do the work, so we pass it to God. So number one, we rely on God too much. You're not going to get anywhere when you're always expecting supreme consciousness to do for you what you clearly have the ability to do for yourself. So that's number one, mm. an over-reliance on God to solve our problems. Number two, the second problem that we have is we have a fatalism that we just talked about, that negativistic energy that infects almost everything that we do. That's number two. And then number three, we do not want to be held accountable for our economic behavior. That is a very big problem. Most cultures, they don't get all in your business, but you are economically held accountable. You're economically accountable to them. Look at the black church. Look at the mega church. Do you know that in most mega churches in our community, you cannot even join without you giving them the, your tax return? They need to see your tax return. Yeah, they need to see what you earn so they can determine what you're going to pay in your tithes. That's how serious the mega church is. Well, guess what? The black community has to become that serious. If you want to come in this meeting and have your opinions heard as to how we need to fix our situation, well, guess what? We need to see your tax return. And we're going to tell you what your contribution is going to be to the Black Liberation Fund. One of our biggest weaknesses within the black conscious community is we do not hold anybody economically responsible. Think about it, fellas. All the meetings you've been to, all the organizations you've been to, Look how serious we have attacked economic obligation to the movement very poorly. That is one thing that we are very ambivalent about discussing. And guess what? 
it's time to discuss it. Because under the Trump era, black folks ain't getting money to do nothing. <laughs> and you can thank Obama for this because he took, he took it off the table. And Trump just going to keep it off the table. You're not getting no grants. You're not getting no handouts. You're not getting nothing that got to do with saving black folks. So if there was ever a time that we need to start holding each other accountable economically, it's now. Because as Garvey said, cannot save the race without a serious economic program. And now it's time for that. You know, uh, Dr. Umar, you talked about, we're talking about black power politics and the need for us to develop some type of political action committee if we're going to be involved in politics at all. And in fact, in this society, we have to be involved politically somehow to uh, uh, to move our people forward to a certain extent. Uh, myself and Brother Richard are, are involved in an organization, One Million Conscious and Conscientious Black Contributors and Voters, where you know, there's planks established and people, sincere, conscious people coming together to not only generate funds uh, to move the needle politically, but generate funds to try to create a, 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 a financially stable businessman among uh, the folks that join the organization and supporting black businesses. Talk about the need to develop not only the organization that we're among, but other organizations similar so we can all work together. I, I don't think one, and this is just my opinion, I might be wrong, I don't think one organization uh, can move the needle for our people. You need a collective effort. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, uh, James Klingman and Brother Amafika Gayuka has done a great job organizing the One Million Conscious and Conscientious Black Contributors and Voters, but you need other organizations to become involved, almost like an umbrella, to move this needle. Am I wrong, Dr. Johnson? Give me your opinion. I, I agree with you. I, I definitely agree with you. And I think another contradiction in I call them that because they have to be dealt with and eliminated. The contradictions can be eliminated. One of the biggest contradictions we have within the black consciousness movement is that the organizations are constantly or allegedly organizing, but they're not organized with each other. There is no, or should I say there's very little, operational unity amongst the organizations. And until you achieve some degree of operational unity amongst the organizations at the leadership level, then, organi then black organization is still a mockery. It doesn't matter how many members you have. If you're going at it alone and you have no operational unity with another organization, then you're still living the contradiction of disunity, you see. And that's the biggest problem because everybody's talking about join the organization, join the organization. But when are the organizations going to get organized? I can't remember the last time I've seen a serious round table of the leaders of the different organizations. And part of that is because there's petty differences and jealousies and envies and conflicts amongst the different organizations. Because how did most of them get formed? Most of them got formed because they fell out with another organization and had to start their own. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you get to a point where you say, okay, now, our personal conflicts are in the past. Now we have to unite for the common good of the people. Yeah, exactly. But see, the other thing, too, that doesn't get dealt with enough within black consciousness is the fact that a lot of people are in black consciousness for the wrong reason. I mean, so many have come to this because they were rejected or denied a seat at the table of white supremacy. You know, a lot of people come into black consciousness because they got to get revenge against the white man for cutting me out. It's not because they love black folks. It's because they need a sounding board. They need their ego massage. They need some sort of public validation for unfulfilled needs from childhood, and that's why they're in black consciousness. Not everyone is here organically. And I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is this assumption. There's this big assumption that everyone in black consciousness is genuinely, purely, and organically here because they want to see black people move forward. I totally disagree with that. In fact, I would say there's very few organizations and there's very few personalities 
in the conscious community who are genuinely there for the advancement of black folk. Most are there for an alternative agenda, whether it's to get paid, whether it's to look important, whether it's to run for public office, whether it's to get enough uh, a legitimacy that you can now go back to the white man like an Al Sharpton and say, hey, my people trust and love me. Now you can use me. I, I got enough collateral now. So we got to really study this thing because a lot of the folks are there for superficial reasons. And then you got to separate the practitioners from the theoreticians. You got to separate the practitioners from the theoreticians. Some brothers and sisters are only interested in book knowledge. They're only interested in debate. They're only interested in discussion. They're only interested in philosophy. They will not at all play any role in any measurable advancement. Let's just keep it real. And then you have the other side, which are practical. These are brothers and sisters who are counting the X's and the O's. They are moving out. They got the agendas and the objectives and the goals. They're about measurable progress. But I would say that they are in the minority. I would say at least 75% of the black consciousness community is purely theoretical, just like the church. 215, Eric Code, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Ben Elliott? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I was having a little trouble before but when, when, when you went back. I, 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 was, I, was, I was talking, but you, I guess you didn't hear me and stuff. We got a better connection now. Hey, hey brother Richard. Hey, Dr. Lamar. How you doing, my mm-hmm. brother? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead, Joe. He can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. okay. You, 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 Dr. Umar, like I've always said, and I mentioned to Elliot on several occasions, Dr. Umar, see, our black leadership in this country, they, like you say, need to be held accountable. White folks couldn't get away with half the stuff they get away. They didn't have Negroes helping them and stuff. When you, one example, Dr. Umar, you look at our police departments around the country. A lot of these black police chief, chiefs or, 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 or captains or whatever, you know, commissioners, whatever, they sit right there and watch black people be brutalized, and they don't do anything. Two, two, two good examples. Up in New York, when Eric Garner got choked to death, the sister that was there, she stood right there, and she was the uh, commander. She was in charge. She had uh, authority over the white officers. She stood right there and let them choke the brother to death. She could have stopped it, you know. Uh, it's just, and, and, and in the other cases where, where black commanding officers been on the scene and they stand right there and let these white cops brutalize their people. When you go, you can go back to Rodney King in '91. People forget there was three or four black police officers stand up to the side. They didn't beat beat Rodney King, but they stood right there and didn't stop it. And they got guns and nightsticks just like the white devil cops got, but they scared to exert their power. And you see that time and time again with black people, whether they be police commissioners, whether they be uh, commanding officers, they stand right there and let these white cops brutalize their people. And that stuff, that this, this foolishness has got to stop. We have got to start holding them accountable just like we hold the, 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 the white man accountable. Because they're sitting there letting these white cops kill and brutalize their people, their, their men, women, and children. You know? Joe, you, and, and you, you, uh, um, the, the, uh, another example yeah. of what you're saying is uh, the, the, a black cop was with that uh, white cop that gunned that man down in South Carolina, shot him in the back, and then yeah, went over there and threw the taser shot, there. Yeah. yeah, it was a black cop with that white cop. That's true. You're right. You're right, brother. He's the, and again, he didn't do anything. He just stood right there. And what, what a white cop he tried to frame the brother, put the taser there. He didn't start to stop it. He, matter of fact, it wasn't for the Puerto Rican brother that filmed it. Then this way with the child, because the black cow would have kept his mouth shut. He, he, he wouldn't have said anything. He would have went right along with the get along, you know, like most of them do, you know. And, I mean, it's just that's amazing. And, and, and then these white police officers in any white community in this country would let a black cop brutalize their men, women, and children. They wouldn't tolerate it. They would not tolerate it. But we but these black cops sit right here, and they let these doctors just brutalize and murder their people, you know. Dr. Umar. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with him. See, the other thing we got to understand is most of what we do as a people is the result of learned behavior that has been intergenerationally transmitted. Remember now, slavery was a divide and conquer culture. The, the meritorious manumission law that our elder Dr. Claude Anderson, my good friend, likes to talk about, 
okay, the, the, the meritorious manumission laws, where if you caught another slave trying to get free and you told on him, you would be blessed for that. You would be paid for that. Sometimes you would get your own freedom. You would be freed from slavery mm-hmm. by keeping another brother from being free. So slavery introduced a culture of individualistic sabotage, individualistic, uh, uh, what you want, betrayal, and individualistic pursuit. So when slavery ended, we continued to operate in that vein, and we still operate in that vein today. It's not about what's in the best interest of black people. It's about what's in my own best interest, and this is why we don't get no respect, because everybody knows that black America has no commitment to itself. And who don't know that? Who don't know that? What race of people don't know that the average African American would do anything he or she could if it earns them a good position with white folks and puts some money in their pocket? We have you lost might. all integrity and we have lost all honor. You might, but brother Uma, I can't say you're wrong, brother. You're, you're, you're right, a hundred percent, man. I just, like I said, I just, I just encourage you, brother, keep on speaking strong, keep doing what you got to do, because see, we need strong black voices in this country that speak to that, and and we don't have enough of them, Doctor Uma. So I just encourage you, brother, to keep speaking strong and staying strong, because we we need them strong voices, especially in this era of, of if you want to call it that, the Nazi that's going to take office in January. So we definitely need them strong voices, because uh, hey, our people, we're, we're at the crossroads. Thank, thank you for your time, Brother Elliot. Thanks, Brother Dr. Umar and Brother Richard. Thank you. Thank you for your call, Joe. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, uh, yeah, Richard, you was getting ready to say something when I took the call. Yeah, no, I was, um, um, Dr. Umar, I was, I was thinking as you were saying about the leadership and, and, and our individual interests. It's, well, it's two things I'd like. When um, Elliot brought up about um, one million, um, one thing I like with um, um, bro- um, Brother Amafik and Bama, um Robert Clayman raised was the point of putting down a clean glass. That the glass isn't half empty or half full, let's put down a clean glass. I like that metaphor because that means we start from ground zero, we build what we want. Um, and we don't, we can't, we won't be, it's not holding anybody else accountable for our actions. But in relationship to where we are now, that most people are individuals um, seeking their own individual interests. Um, and we're trying to, if we are trying to create power, we we have to. Do you think we have to be more skillful in negotiating with each other? Which means that one, we have to be more honest of what our individual interest is. Therefore, if our interest is about running as a politician, if our interest is about getting um, money, if our interest is about just satisfying our our ego that we have to be more honest with each other so that we can negotiate so that we can be able to create some operational unity that is real without denying the individual of their interests, which makes everybody clear what that individual or what that group is going for. I think the answer to the question is yes. But I also think before we get to the point where we're going to expend energy, uh, trying to be strategic in how we negotiate with each other to forge that collective consciousness of shared work and responsibility. I think that we have to make sure we have selected the right people to work with. Because before you get to that level, you have to do your, your search and selection. Because we got to understand something. The black struggle will not be a utopia. The black struggle is not a utopia. Most of our people, more than 50%, and I'm not being pessimistic. I'm an optimist because I know we're going to win this situation. So I have complete faith and confidence in our ability to bring about that revolutionary pan-African nationalist redemption. But I do know that at least half the black folks who are living and breathing in America will not and cannot be a part of that struggle. They are absolutely loyal to white folks, absolutely loyal. That's most of your entertainers, your actors, most of your PhDs, most of your lawyers, most of your medical doctors, 
most of your middle class, most of your masons, most of your fraternities and sororities, not all of them, because I don't put everyone in the same box, but most of them will fight against you more than they will fight for you. So we have an obligation to find the brothers and sisters who are still committed, those who are still willing to sacrifice for the greater good of the race. And that doesn't mean everybody has to be a Nat Turner. That doesn't mean that if they're not a Nat Turner, you don't work with them. But they, they must have more interest vested in our resurrection as a people than they have invested in their relationships with the power structure. You see, and, there's, and, different, and, there's levels of commitment. Some people and, are willing to die. Some people ain't willing to die, but they're willing to go to jail. Some people ain't willing to go to jail, but they're willing to lose their job. Some people ain't willing to lose their job, but they're willing to lose their house. So there is levels of commitment, but you at least have to make sure that they are committed. And that's what I was, that's what I, when I, and I, and I agree with you because I think, you know, definitely that there is, and, um, and I don't like when they say it, you know, black people is not a monolith, and I, but I do agree with it, agree with you um, on that point that there are segments whose value is tied to, the, you know, um, the American project, um, as you will. But there, but what I, I think that we have to look at is the, and what you kind of um, bring up in the, the, the diffusion is that amongst us who, as you say, are black conscious, that we have particular interests. And the reason why we haven't unified, created operational unity, is because of, and the leadership, because I think I heard you say if it was possible for those who were just black consciousness, conscious, if they were just able or we were just able to sit at the table with each other, then we could be, even if for nobody else, um, specifically with our history, know that there is an opposition out there, and know that we have we have goals and aspirations, but we still would have to negotiate with each other because our even amongst us we have people who are ego driven, people who are yes, narcissists, yes, yes, people who yes. who are looking um, looking for some self gratification, looking for mm-hmm. uh, accumulation of wealth. So let's. If, even if we recognize that these other black um, groupings are out there, the question is still, well, amongst us, what is it that we're going to have to you know, sacrifice, at, you know, at least when we come to the table, or how much we have to be honest in order to begin the negotiating process with each other so we can sit at the table? As you used the example was, about the mafia earlier, some families don't. Some families will war with each other, but uh, but they 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 know how to. They still work with each other because they're doing business. They have social relationships. They have a a bond that they created with each other. And don't we, as the supposedly a part of the black consciousness, have those same values and aspirations? But what we have, don't have is a mechanism of creating operational union at this point. Well, you, Without well, look, question, but I, exactly, and I, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. And again, just to reiterate, um, in support of what you're saying as well, we got to make sure you got the right people at that table because, mm-hmm. you know, we all have our political principles. So there's certain things that cannot be negotiated. So, for example, you know, if someone says, okay, well, we got to do something about it. we got to stop, you know, saying that, you know, black men can't marry outside of their community. Well, that's a non-negotiable for the Pan-African National. For the Garvey Act, that's a non-negotiable. So that's why we got to make sure we got the right people at that table. But I also think that when we do come together, ideology shouldn't have too much of a place at the table because just like religion, it'll cause more conflict than problems it solves. So when we come together, we should come together for one thing, and that is purpose, P-U-R-P-O-S-E. Whenever we come together, we come together for purpose. And why? Because when you come together with a purpose, progress towards the goal can be measured. When you come together with a purpose, you don't have to worry about debating ideology. When you come together with a purpose, it's always about progress towards the goal. And when you come together with a purpose, everyone is in need of the same things, whether you Hebrew, Nawabian, Moor, God and Earth, Nation of Islam, Black Nationalism, Black Socialism, Garveyism, Pan-Africanism. We all need food, clothing, shelter, community security, health care, family, 
You see, so what we all need, we need in common. So by coming together around purpose, it eliminates all the extra rhetorical intellectual masturbation that often sabotages most meetings. See, black people always say we meet too much, we talk too much. I'm tired of talking, I want action. There could be no action without talking. You don't get nothing done until you meet. The white man meet all day long. All day long. You got long. meetings on top of meetings on top of meetings on top of meetings. The difference between our meetings and everybody else's meetings is our meetings are too philosophical, and everyone else's meetings are practical. We spend too much time debating beliefs. Forget the beliefs. Come together around purpose. And I'll add two more of these, principle and process. Dr. Johnson, let let me ask you something, because whether we're talking about uh, uh, political action committee for lack of a better term or party the one thing that 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 that, uh, that's common to both of those is the generation of money and being able to generate money now you mentioned some things earlier about some of the things that are that our people psychologically have to get have to to realize they have a problem so they can move forward but what is it that and you deal with the mind. That's your profession. What is it that a hundred years ago that caused our people to rally around, I would say, one of the greatest men we had in this diaspora, Marcus Garvey, and give some, some gave their last money to what he was trying to do, and now we can't get people to, to get behind even a common idea to give money. People will give lip service, but when it comes time to pass the plate, your, your hand gets short. I mean, I don't understand what change between what Garvey was saying and the, and, the, and the people, the money that Marcus Garvey and the network, he was able to generate without the benefit of a telephone. Telephone was a relatively new invention at that time. There was no television, definitely was no internet. He was able to generate a network of people and generate dollars. And here we have phones, internet, uh, uh, TV. I mean, we have any electronic device we can muster, and we can't generate a million dollars without white without white folks getting involved and putting their money in. And the next thing you know, the ideas are subverted. But talk about this. What is it going to take? Well, Go ahead. Remember, the Garvey movement was founded. 50 years after slavery. So black people were still in a situation where we knew we were oppressed. We knew we didn't have nothing. We still didn't have any laws to protect us from murder or lynching or anything like that. We didn't have a whole bunch of black professionals running around. There was no NFL. There was no NBA. There was no Oprah Winfrey. To make a long story short, Garvey did not have to convince black folks that they were in trouble. He had to convince them to follow him. But he didn't have to convince them that they were in trouble. Okay. Your problem today is that you have to convince black people that they are in trouble. And that's the difference. Back then, the racism was obvious. It was brutal. You could only work in certain jobs. You could only involve yourself in certain professions, certain places you couldn't go once the sun went down, certain places you couldn't live, and white folks told you that's the way it is. In other words, the, the racial consciousness was extremely high, extremely high, because the racism was extremely pure. It was a pure, unapologetic white supremacy. We knew we were in trouble. That's the difference. Today, we don't know that. Now you and See, back then, all black people were concentrated, largely in the same social economic stratus. Okay. Even if you had a degree, you lived in the ghetto. When W.E.B. Du Bois taught at the University of Pennsylvania, he could not live with the white professors in Westfield. He had to live in the hood. All them degrees. He had to live with his own people, so that forged a certain type of camaraderie. When you are dead, broke, and poor, but right next to you is a Ph.D., we knew we were in, we were in the situation we were in because we were black and we knew it. It's different now. Now the white man has created the illusion of inclusion where you have so many black folks who will say it's not that bad. 
It's not blaming racism. It's you. You're the problem. Look at Oprah. She's a billionaire. Look at LeBron. Look at Robert Johnson. Look at all these successful black people. How can you say it's racism? So now black people ain't sure no more. They're like, well, wait a minute. They, what, I mean, look, they're doing all right. Maybe it ain't white, man. Maybe we the ones pulling ourselves back. Back then, we knew it was white. We knew it was racist. We knew it was racist. And now you have the illusion of inclusion. You have to convince black people that racism is their problem. You know, we, we went a little overtime with you, uh, Dr. Johnson. I, 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 I don't know whether I'm keeping you from uh, catching a few Zs before you go and speak tonight, but I'm glad that you was able to stay with us a little bit over time. Yes, indeed. It was definitely, definitely an honor. Uh, when I leave, I speak in Los Angeles tomorrow, and then I, my next stop will be Brooklyn. I'm the keynote speaker for the annual Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad Earth Day celebration, which will be in Brooklyn, 415 Atlantic Avenue. I repeat, 415 Atlantic Avenue next Thursday, uh, January the 12th, which is Dr. Khaled's Earth Day, I believe. And um, we'll be in Brooklyn, so feel free to come on up. Philadelphia can take the ride and come on up as well. And then I will be in Atlanta at the request of Reverend Dr. Bernice King, youngest daughter of the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. She invited me to be part of a panel on race in America, which will be at the King Center on King Day next Monday, January the 16th. That is a 6 to 8.30 program. The Brooklyn program for Dr. Khalid is a 7 to 10 o'clock program. And then I will be in Durham, North Carolina, uh, Durham on Tuesday the 17th, and then San Diego, California. I'm inviting everyone to come to San Diego for the National Invitation Training Conference for the National Independent Black Parent Association, an organization I started early in 2016 to organize black parents to fight against academic racism in the seven key areas of special education, school discipline, school finance, school policy, homeschooling, parent advocacy, and social support. So if anyone wants to be part of an organization that is all about practical gains, not ideological masturbation, feel free to come to the Black-Owned World Beat Cultural Center, San Diego, California, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Friday and Saturday, January 26th and 27th, 27th and 28th, excuse me, and then there will be a lecture on Sunday the 29th, and then it's Black History Month, and we start Black History Month this year at Bowie State University in Bowie, Maryland, one of our HBCUs, on February the 1st. Dr. Johnson, your your schedule is always full, but I'm glad that you mentioned again about the the focus being on the children. I I really believe that this is where things are really going to change for us, Uh, and this is only my belief. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, some of these some of the folks that we have that's that's uh, forty and over, I, I don't know whether they can. I, I don't. I maybe I'll just leave those feelings to myself for now. I, I think it's good that the focus now is on the youth. We got to develop the mindset among our youth uh, to move our people forward. It, it's it's the illusion of inclusion in this country. We can see that this country has a mindset especially moving forward to create a permanent underclass of black people where we'll never be able to move forward. And the only thing that the youth will look forward to is uh, the prison industrial complex. We have to change that paradigm. And if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. I'm glad you're out there fighting for these things to be done. Douglas said it best. Douglas said it best when he said it's better to raise strong children than to repair broken men. Wow. And that is actually going to be the motto of the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. That is our official motto. That is better to raise strong children than to repair broken men. Richard, you want to say something before uh, Dr. Johnson? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, as, as we talk about the children, and the thing that I think that we should possibly emphasize is that those children are the only strategic resource that we have. We don't have land. We don't have weapons. We don't have. We can't. We don't have no mine. We don't have no farm. But the children that we have, if we treat them as strategic resources, raw raw material, 
and we are actually developing and we stay focused, as you say, on the purpose of creating Africans that can um, take us into the 21st, 22nd, 23rd century. I say. I you, say to that. You know, before you leave, Dr. Johnson, let me, let me say something because I want to get your opinion on this. I believe, and this is my belief, that we're going to have to get somebody or some, no, I don't want to put it on an individual, a group of people that the children and, and people uh, people in general look up to to really change their mindset and start doing things differently. Uh, and I'm saying that in relation to what uh, the football player from uh, uh, San Francisco, Colin Kaepernick, did uh, during the beginning of the season when he started at first raising his fist but then kneeling down. And some of the other players, uh, just a few on each team, started joining him. You need to get not only people being visual, but being vocal about the injustices of this community, of this nation, and black people doing something together. You need to have more voices. It needs to be taken to another level. Uh, what he did was good, uh, raising his fist, but you need more action among some of these people with means. You know, being that money is par- uh, paramount in a lot of these movements, you, you're you going to need some of these people with real money to donate something to help our people move forward. Because in the age where we have this television is strong and social media, multimedia, visual, things visual is really what our people need to see. They need to see something you, you mentioned before in your conversation about the Oprahs, the Michael Jordans. When they see these people uh, basically doing certain things, given to the NAACP, uh, uh, giving to accepted organizations, but not trying to move the needle to move our people forward, they don't feel as though things can change or will change. But I, I think that we need conscious individuals, some type of consciousness to develop among some of these people to help some of these youth change their mindset. I, 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 what do you say in reference to that? Uh, I agree. Uh, the only thing I would probably take exception to is we don't need the celebrities because we ain't going to get them. Okay. And when you look at our gross national product, I mean, again, $600 million on McDonald's, what you need to check from Oprah for? I mean, $4 billion on malt liquor, you don't need no money from Oprah. What we wow. need to do is we need to discipline our own economics. Redirect the we need dollars. To discipline huh? our own e- exactly. Okay. When you look at all of our great movements, whether it's the Garvey movement, the Nation of Islam, the Moore Science, the Civil Rights, Black Power, none of those movements were financed in significant fashion by rich blacks. None of them. <laughs> it was the pennies of everyday black folks that financed those organizations. We don't need them. I'm not looking to them now. If they show up with a check, great. But we should not expect nothing from them because they are the new bourgeoisie. Remember now, under Obama and under Trump, that so-called middle class category, that is quickly being eradicated. Yes. There is no more middle class in America, for black or white, by the way, for black or white. You're either rich or you're poor. Ain't no more middle class. So the new bourgeoisie in the black community are the athletes and entertainers. It's the Jay-Z's and the Beyonce's. They are the new bourgeoisie. So we cannot look to them to do anything for us. Again, if they come, great. But we have enough economics on our own. I mean, come on. $3 billion on Christmas, black Philadelphia. $3 billion, I don't need a dollar from Jay-Z if we got $3 billion for Christmas. What we have to do is organize our, this, organize our spending habits. Their children already got their life made. They, they, their children are set. They don't need to fight against the school system. Their children are millionaires already. It's us who have to make this happen for ourselves, and we can do it. What Garvey said, Garvey said, if you got to know yourself today, if we got to know ourselves today, we can have a new reality in 24 hours. Dr. Johnson, give out any social media, any where people can see the website, anything that you want to say before you leave. Uh, yes, uh, I can be reached at drumarjohnson.com, D-R-U-M-A-R johnson.com. Please continue to uh, donate to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy fundraiser at GoFundMe.com forward slash Dr. Umar. GoFundMe.com forward slash Dr. Umar. 
Um, also, don't forget the Tuesday morning Black Parent Teleconference, 857-232-0158. That's 857-232-0158 with an access code of 870-864-POUND, 870-864-POUND. If you need to reach me, 844-4-DR-UMAR, that's 844-4-D-R-U-M-A-R. If you're on Twitter and Instagram, you can follow me at Dr. Umar Johnson. Facebook is Dr. Umar E. Fatunde. I use my Yoruba name on Facebook, but you want to look for Dr. Umar E. Fatunde, which is spelled I-F-A-T-U-N-D-E. I should also have the information for the upcoming two-week trip to Africa. We do it every year, fourth annual coming up, last week of July, first week in August. Two-week Black College and Consciousness Tour. From Atlanta, June 28th to July the 12th. Again, if anyone needs to reach me, that's the call-in number. If you need to text me, you can do so at area code 215-989-9858. Area code 215 Up, 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 you mighty race you can accomplish what you will. Dr. Umar, if you get an opportunity, send me some of that information. I'll put it on the Time for Awakening website. And thanks Definitely. for being with us, man. Thank you, my brother the time for an awakening i want to thank our guests this evening clinical, clinical psychologist and activist dr umar johnson was with us in conversation brother richard yes sir <laughs> interesting conversation we had with dr johnson yes sir. And, and good i believe it uh it helps in the development of you know this whole notion of power and politics organizing and what we have to do with individuals um, being leaders unto ourselves um, with each other in order to bring about, about that future. So I, I, I believe also it was a great interaction with Brother um, Dr. Umar. You know, and, and one thing I, I always like about uh, a lot of the guests that we have on, that he in particular has uh, extensive contact with a lot of youth. And youth are impressionable. And they will look up to somebody that they see as making an impact in their lives or showing care for them. They'll look to emulate that. I knew when I was young, I'd look to try to emulate everything my dad did because he was the man, the man, uh, the man influence in my life. Some of these young boys don't have a man that is steady in their lives. And when he's out there doing those things, taking them on college tours, even spending time, he mentioned that amusement parks, those things make a huge impact in the minds of young boys and girls. so yes. uh, And they are future leaders. So if they see somebody like him being an example, they can't help from following in their footsteps. It's a bright future for our people. It's a, it's a bright future. You can't look at it any differently. Yes, sir. Uh, before we leave this evening, uh, moving into this year and moving forward, there's going to be changes on time of awakening. We can see tonight is just one of them. Uh, more days, more interesting guests, more open forums. Uh, it's it's time. It's time for an awakening. I want to thank our listening audience for participating in the conversation this evening. Lively discussion as always, and we'll be back on Sunday, Lord willing, to continue on this path towards an awakening. <laughs>